want to recognize uh, one of our sponsors, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, and you know uh, Ryan Dolan's here uh, of data dissemination, uh, staff person. But thanks, Ryan, and I under understand there's some programs that you can at tell us about online that has some of this information that we were talking about today. Why don't you come up? How about a hand for Ryan Dolan, U.S. Census Bureau? Thank you. Um, my name is Ryan Dolan. I'm a data dissemination specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau. And I've been in and out of the conference today and noticed you were talking a lot about some of our statistics that we provide. And I want to let you know that we offer training, hands-on computer lab training, either at your workplace, at a nonprofit organization, a business. Uh, we provide stats for local governments. So if you're interested in that, please stop and see me during the coffee break or after the conference closes and grab my business card because we're eager to help. Uh, we spend a lot of money and resources collecting this data and we want to make sure everyone's using it. So, thank you. Well, nice and short and sweet. That's what we like. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay thank you. Well, we're going to um, start uh, the afternoon sessions. Um, we have, we have two afternoon sessions. We have uh, uh, the Hispanic market, and then we're going to finish with uh, the African research study. And uh, we wanted to have that at the end. There was so much interest with that study that we kind of put it at the end so you'll stay for the whole day and not get home and you know, cut the grass and whatever else we do here. Um, to introduce Carlos Garcia, we're going to have a, a gentleman here at Metropolitan State University, you all know, who was involved with the committee to actually organize this conference. How about a hand for Tom, Tom Boylan? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Mr. Carlos Garcia. Mr. Garcia is a highly respected leader in, the his, in Hispanic research, providing insights that have guided major marketing and advertising efforts in a variety of industries. As, as founder and guiding force of our Garcia Research Associates, now a part of GFK Company, where he has recently um, ha was asked to head up their new multicultural practice division, uh, his clients have included industry leaders in packaged goods, healthcare, entertainment, and financial services. Mr. Garcia, his research experience ranges from new products and ad development to segmentation to deep dive economics, political and brand equity studies. Mr. Garcia was a cum laude graduate in foreign languages from Panoma College in Claremont, California. He holds a master's degree from the University of California at Berkeley and National University in, in San Diego. Mr. Garcia will present a strategic look at 2010 census and the growth of the Hispanic community in the U.S. Hispanic populations are now located in most areas of the United States with large Hispanic population shifts to southern and midwest states. Mr. Garcia will also look at the state of Hispanic marketing and the various media, TV, radio, print, and the internet campaigns being used by corporate America. Spanish versus English usage in advertising to Hispanics will be discussed. Mr. Carlos Garcia. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here at Metrosexual State. <clears throat> and by the way, I did, it's a Pomona College, not a Panoma. Pomona. It's Pomona. Pomona, of course, is the goddess of fruits and nuts. So it was perfectly appropriate that I should go there. Um, so um, I'm, I, this is what the, he just read was a description of uh, the assignment that Rick gave. And uh, true to my form, I completely ignored him uh, and uh, went on my own path and uh, started doing some other stuff. One of the interesting things here, I wanted to show you this. This is the slide we use for our multicultural to show all the various cultures. However, all of those people, any of those people, could be Latinos or Latinos. So, uh, so we're going to talk about some demographic information, some trends, and some forecasts. We'll also be uh, talking about 10 things for marketers to consider. And then I'm hoping to have a real interesting, interesting and open conversation with you about some of the perceptions that you have about our market and some of the, your reaction to some of the things that I have said. Uh, as well. So <clears throat> I'm now the SVP, uh, it said there for Hispanic research. My new title is SVP for multicultural research. 
Uh, we are going to be expanding and developing our multicultural services. Um, and uh, GFK, uh, my new company, has made a big commitment to this arena. So it's a pretty exciting place to be. Uh, somewhat too exciting. But um, <laughs> I'm a first generation US born. Both of my parents were born in Mexico. And um, I grew up in uh, East Los Angeles. And um, I always talk about uh, the People's Republic of East Los. <laughs> There are more Latinos in Los Angeles than there are Isra the Israelis in Israel, than there are Danes in Denmark, than there are Kiwis in New Zealand. And I don't understand why we don't have our own seat in the Security Council. I, d I just don't know. So, um, yeah, my education there is proof of being, you know, I'm perfectly over-educated. Over uh, <clears throat> one of the examples of that was at one point I was able to... Uh, Taking my last class through my last ma my second master's program, which is my MBA, uh, I was able to take just listen to the professor, take notes in my notebook, and I could have turned that my notebook in as the final exam. I could tell by the inflection by that point in my career, I could tell from the inflection of my professor's voice what questions were going to be in the final, and I was 100% right. I could have just turned in my notes, and there it was. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so I ran my own company. Yes, I always was a smart ass. Um, and I ran my own country, company for 21 years, and then I was, my company was acquired by a larger company, and then now, six months later, acquired by a global giant. So my, you know, my head is still spinning, and if I do a Linda Blair uh, in, uh, in, uh, impression, no, don't be surprised. So we have a lot of information to talk to you about, and this is my favorite. This slide is amazing. This is the rising tide. And other people have talked about this numbers, but this just shows it as a rising tide. And that 47% in 2050 does not include Native Americans. It does not include uh, uh, GLBT. Um, and, there are, uh, and it doesn't really include all the mixed race. So that, in that, that uh, rising tide, which is raising, going to raise all ships that are prepared, is very clear. Uh, you see the Hispanic market going up essentially two percentage points uh, or more of the total American population every 10 years. And the African American about half a percentage point, and the Asian American also about a half a percentage point. So that's uh, pretty impressive. And uh, basically I was describing it say, to my in internally to my people at GFK, this is the rising tide that will raise the ships that are prepared. And if you're not, you're on a, on a little spit of land um, a little sandbar that's eroding away, and somebody's phone is ringing. Please turn off your phones. Um, a little spit of land with Katrina coming, okay? Because the world is going to be a different place, and you have to be prepared for it. This is looking at just Hispanics, and this is a pretty interesting look, um, <clears throat> especially because the, the, the new immigrants, this, this group here was where all of the Hispanic advertising had always been focused. They were going after the Spanish dominant consumers. The immigra immig new immigrant group was growing faster uh, than any other, and it was always the uh, focus of concern. Uh, they were afraid of wanting to reach people who were not otherwise being reached with their general market advertising. Well, those are the old days, uh, and that's no longer the case. And that's not the way things are working these days. So you see the various shades of blue. I mean, they're all still blue. They get a little paler and paler and paler as they go up. But basically, you're looking at um, the, the new, new face of the Hispanic market, that it is going to be a mul more multi-generational uh, space. <clears throat> What's really interesting is that you looked at, at the uh, uh, culturation factors over the years, and most people do some sort of a culturation segmentation, and it usually comes out with three main groups, the, you know, the quote-unquote unacculturated, which is the term I hate, because it sounds like people don't have a culture. They do have a culture. So I call them, you know, uh, highly, either highly Hispanic or less acculturated. So uh, your choice. Uh, and then there's the bicultural and then there's the high, highly acculturated. But even the highly acculturated are still Latinos. And, but, every, but everybody always assumed that, that if you looked at these three groupings, that what's going to happen in America is that all of the unacculturated are going to go zooming into the bicultural and the bicultural are going to zoom into the highly acculturated. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is the bicultural group is the group that's growing. And the bicultural group is the group that's, that's growing and stretching its, uh, its, its fluffing its feathers and uh, sort of strutting its, its, its buying power. 
And this is a market that sees English and Spanish language TV, you know, can, are perfectly competent or capable in both languages. Uh, and so uh, all marketing messages uh, from both sides are hitting them. And if they're contradictory or if they're not coordinated, you're going to have problems. And so the, the, the Hispanic ad agencies used to have a really simple task. They only did things in Spanish. Their only focus was on Sp the, the Spanish dominant and the least acculturated. Um, and that doesn't fly anymore because the big bulk of the market is now also influenced by general market advertising. So general market agencies can't get away with their old BS, which was to just pretend that everyone was just like them, which they are not. And the Hispanic ad agencies, which used to basically bring in people from Latin America who were, you know, completely Spanish dominant, hadn't gone through any of the acculturation experiences that people experience when they grow up here. Uh, and the advertising that they were doing was so nostalgic and, and retro that it doesn't, didn't reflect on the realities that people faced as they lived here in the U.S. and, and, and slowly adapted to the American culture. <clears throat> so this is where Hispanics live, uh, and you can see the various colors. Uh, the blue is Mexican, of course. Uh, the red is uh, Puerto Rican, and the green is Cuban. And um, you'll see how uh, the blues win. Um, and this, this is the Mexican population. I'm sorry? Somebody? No. Uh, this is the Mexican population, and there are a couple of really pretty funny things about this. Um, one is, obviously you'll see, you know, the, the two states, the two biggest states, California and Texas, between them they basically can, uh, come close to about 50% of the total market, of the total Hispanic market, so it's pretty, pretty dramatic. The LA market alone is about 20% of the total U.S. Hispanic market. So it's obviously pretty big, but there's a couple of little interesting things that, that, that surprised me. One is this. There are Mexicans in Alaska. What are, these are people who... These are people who think LA is the frozen north, okay? <laughs> Seriously, uh, and it's pretty funny. So uh, let me see, we're, we're somewhere in the big, the flyover states, right? right? Okay, <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, see, this is Minnesota, right? I hope, yay. Uh, but you see these, these dots are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and they're getting all over the place and they're not just, you know, just the, the classic big four or five. Um, they're all over the place. And you can see up here some of the growth, uh, growth uh, uh, in specific areas, specifically the south. Um, and it's pretty dramatic and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty stunning, uh, particularly in places like, this. what's not even on there is Georgia because Atlanta is now a huge Hispanic market. Um, you can look at that. Georgia is just, is, is, is very big. Um, Alabama, of course, has been hit by this, you know, huge anti-immigrant fervor, and now uh, all of their crops are going unpicked, and they can't get labor. Um, but uh, Arizona, with uh, that same anti-immigrant fervor, they're not going to go away. These people were there way before the white people showed up, so, you know, we're not going away. So th this whole stuff will just have to blow over, and it will. Um, these, are, these are people who have the long-term view. <laughs> they don't call it La Reconquista for nothing. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so uh, one thing I thought was really funny is that uh, I wouldn't have thought that, Port that the Hawaii would be dominated by the Puerto Rican population, but I guess if you like islands, you like islands. It just makes sense to me. So this is uh, the actual drama dramatization of, you know, in a big, big old pie chart of the, the total, and you can see how important the Mexican population is relative to everything else. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing that, uh, that Saul was talking about is how relatively powerful the Asian community is relative to the other communities simply because of their buying power. And the same is true of the Cubans. Cubans are only 4%, 4% of the total Hispanic market. But they are, they're all over TV. You, they're all over the news. When everybody thinks, oh, Hispanic market, they get Marco Rubio. He, you know, it's 4%, it's just 4%. So they are not, the, the, uh, not even, no longer even a majority in, in, in Miami. There's still plurality, but they're less than 50%. So the large numbers of other populations in Miami and in Florida, but they're sim the sim single largest group. And the one group that I think is growing, the one sees in LA growing the fastest, so the Salvadorians and the Guatemalans, the Central Americans are really uh, pretty uh, a substantial presence in Los Angeles, which no one really talks about. 
So here's some dizzying numbers. Uh, a dizzying, I mean, market researchers love to bombard people with numbers like these. And <clears throat> this is showing the market size in millions in 2008, Hispanic market share, real growth of the, of the Hispanic market from 2005 to 2008, real growth of the non-Hispanic market 2005, 2008, and the real demand created by Hispanics in millions. Okay, and you see the non-Hispanic market, many of them are negative numbers, or they're basically all negative numbers, or zero, or you know, almost negative numbers. So um, no, no growth, market growth, total, total restaurant and food categories is a minus 2.5. So there's contraction in the non-Hispanic market. But the Hispanic market is 5.2% of real growth. So without the Hispanic market, we'd be in trouble. Everybody in the food business would be in trouble. Look at cereal. General Mills was here earlier. I don't know if they're still here. But the real, real growth here, minus 2.2 in the non-Hispanic, plus 4.1 in the Hispanic. Um, salad dressings, 7.4% growth versus a minus 2.8. Peanut butter. Hispanics actually under-index on peanut butter. They don't even like peanut butter. They're 7 .4, they represent 7.9% of the market. Uh, versus their 16.8% of the actual uh, total. Um, but still, uh, c contraction in the general market, dramatic growth in the Hispanic, mar in the Hispanic market. And, there was, and the result of, you see the gap between the 7.9 and the, and the 16.8, you think, hmm, potential. I happen to be one of the people who do doesn't like peanut butter. Most Americans think me a communist for saying that. But um, anyway, so you can see across all of these, all of these categories, the real growth is all coming from the Hispanic market. Now, um, all the multicultural groups are growing. Um, you know, the Hispanic market that ex exceeded one trillion already in 2010 um, is, ex is growing up to 1.5 trillion by 2015. So you don't have to wait till 2050 to have a big ass market. You do not have to wait, it's here now. Uh, and that's, that's trillion with a T. Okay, just so in case anybody was wondering. Uh, the African American market is also growing, going up to uh, to 1.2 trillion by 2015. The uh, Asian American market is growing uh, close to a trillion, uh, and the GLBT is uh, also going close to a trillion. So, um, pretty pretty amazing growth. And you add these up together, you have a pretty substantial chunk of the market. So, the days they are changing. So. Um, you know, used to do, um, I work in research, right? So a lot of, of, of the ethnic research used to be done with add-ons for, for my, the, the, the minority markets. And um, they didn't really accept or understand that, the, we were, that we were and are becoming the general market. Uh, one thing I like to say is that the general market has now been demoted. It's a lieutenant market now, no longer general. And the total market is all of us. The total market is the total market. General market is just like a code word for white people. Uh, frankly, middle-aged white people, middle-aged white men to be precise. Uh, and, but that is really, you know, it's really changing. And more and more corporate, corporate uh, uh, entities are recognizing this. Uh, but I have to say still, when I, when I travel around to all these corporations all around the country, I will walk into a room like this and we'll be doing a big presentation and I'll be pretty shocked at how white the room is. Actually, I made the mistake once of even commenting on that to a client. I said, boy, this is a white room. And she, she absolutely bristled. She was really <laughs> upset. But it's true. And we were there presenting stuff about doing multicultural marketing. I mean, how could you do multicultural marketing if you don't have anybody in your room you know, that you work with that represents those markets? You might as well be marketing to Martians. You know, you don't know them. You don't know what they want, what they need, what they feel like, what feels right to them, what s smells right to them, what tastes right to them, that, you know, all of that stuff. You need to have your marketplace, you, your, um, your workforce, represent the market you are trying to reach. And, you know, I'll go ahead and piss people off, and I'm going to keep on mentioning that. I said, you know, um, the, if the room, the room does not reflect the market you hope to reach, you are not going to reach it. I mean, even with really good people who are really trying, 
you know, they're, they're, you know, who really care and want it to work, there are some things that they will miss. And it's just, it's just sad. I mean, uh, we, we really need to collectively make, get this figured out. So marketing needs to address the entire market, total market messaging tailored to all relevant groups, uh, and, and the right vehicles when appropriate for each target. Researchers need sample sources and research techniques that are harmonized for comparison across all demographic groups, but still tease out differences. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the issues that I have um, is how different communities use scales. And that's one of the problems that people are used to applying their certain general market approaches and expect it to work in the Hispanic space, and it won't. One second. Anyway, um, for example, um, Hispanics tend to be very polite. They're very sweet, very gentle, very polite, and um, it's not so much true of the Cubans, but, uh, but <laughs> especially the Mexicans. <laughs> no, it's true. The, the Cubans are, m and any of the Puerto Ricans are very ready to give negative comments when, when needed. They'll, they'll use the whole scale. No problem. Uh, and that's generally true of all, anybody who lives in New York City. You know, they'll also, like, <laughs> read your beads in a second. Um, but uh, in the uh, Hispanic market, especially the Mexican market, especially the Southwest markets, um, they're really nice. They'll always say nice things. So you get 95% top two box. Now what good does that do you? You have seven different, seven different concepts you're testing and everybody liked all of them. So obviously if you, if you set up your, your, your research program to mirror your general market research program, you're going to come up with data you won't be able to read. You will not get discrimination. You will not know which one is the best one, which and why. You'll think, oh, they like everything. And many people will say, clients will say, oh, they like them all. That's great. So it doesn't matter which one we pick. Well, no. I would not say that. Um, you have to be very careful with that. And the Asian community in general tends to, tend to actually skew toward the bottom part of the scale. And the African American community, in my experience, tends to go either up or down. They either love you or they hate you. So they'll use both ends of the scale, but they, they all, every different community has their own way of doing these things. So we've developed techniques over the years to try to get around these issues, and we set up these, like, these, this, the, the, our, our ideal approach is called max diff, where we basically set up a whole series of choices, of discrete choices, and get people to pick um, which of, of, the, of these concepts which would make you most likely and least likely to buy this product, um, or this, this attribute, or this claim, or this... Um, color or flavor or whatever, you know, all the various things you might be testing. And so you get, you get the first top, out of, four, out of four options, you get top choice, bottom choice. And then you mix, do them all, mix them up all enough to, so the statistics, statisticians can do their magic. Uh, and then you come up with not just a ranking, but a ranking that also shows the, 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 the degree of, of, of preference. So you get a score that says like 350 versus 250 versus versus 75 and tw you know, 25. So you basically get a midpoint, you know where your midpoint is, you know how, how, how not just which ones rise to the top, but how, by how much. And so it's really, and it works for general market, it works for everybody, it works for African Americans, Asian Americans, uh, and uh, Latinos as well as uh, other countries around the world. So we're in the process of actually sort of developing global, a global Rosetta Stone that'll help us understand how to interpret data because it's not always so easy. So I want to start here with 10 things for marketers to consider. Um, and these are basically based on my 30 plus years of experience and a lot of qualitative group, groups, uh, a lot of uh, you know, triads and dyads and one-on-ones and, and a lot of quantitative studies. Uh, but these are things that I've seen now that I think uh, would be things that uh, marketers need to consider. Uh, and here's the summary of them. Uh, and uh, it is that, you know, there are many types of Hispanic consumers. We'll talk about that. Integrate, don't isolate. Communicate, don't translate. Young Latinos wouldn't be known for who they are, not what they are. Mom knows best. Consensus and compromise. Hispanics don't live in a one-on-one -on -one world. The buying process for Hispanics is changing. Uh, Hispanic marketing is getting more complicated, but that's complicated, but that's good. Uh, and Hispanic research is fun, but it isn't easy. 
So let's start with, um, there are many different types of Hispanic consumer. Now, every single group has talked about this before. There's no just one type of, of a gay consumer. There's no one type of Asian consumer. Uh, and by the way, I really loved Christine's, um, uh, Christina's uh, a presentation of uh, uh, Gay Marketing 101. And I can also say I'm available for private tutoring. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> only one person got that. Uh, <laughs> and she's not a buyer either. Um, anyway, um, th so anyway, so the Hispanics are, are, are segmented and uh, segmentable in many ways. Some people say Hispanics are a segment, so we'll just market to Hispanics. That is ridiculously simplistic uh, and would not work, uh, could not possibly work. So there are many different ways there, there are, they are distinguished. Uh, they are distinguished by country of origin, acculturation level, socioeconomic group, geographic distribution, shopping and pur purchasing behaviors, personal traits, such as loving or hating cooking, for example, or and attitudes um, and propensity for new product adoption and things like that. So acculturation groupings are not a replacement for category-specific segmentation. That is the most important thing I need to say here. People will do a, 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 an acculturation segmentation in the Hispanic space and just use that as their only segmentation. That is not even vaguely appropriate. The thing is, every different category will have different sort of attitudes and perceptions. Some people like chewing gum, some people don't. Some people like to cook, some people don't. You know, uh, uh, hello, and it, and it cuts across, you know, acculturation levels. It cuts, you know, so it's, it's not so simple a thing. You can't just assume because they're unacculturated, they all love to cook. My mother was born in Mexico, couldn't cook her way out of a paper bag. <laughs> not on a bet. We used to go home for things, but all of her kids cook. My dad was a good cook. Uh, so we would go to the home for Thanksgiving and tie her to a chair in the, kit, in the kitchen tell, so she could tell us where things were. We wouldn't let her touch a thing. <laughs> so, you know, so you, every, every person is going to be different. Every person is going to have a different relationship to a category, different relationship to brands. Uh, they may come from a country where, where your brand was very well known or from a country where, they, where their brand wasn't even visible. Uh, they may not have any history with you. Um, so, you know, it really, really varies. Um, so they really need to look at, his, every country, company needs to look at how Hispanics relate to a particular category and a particular brand, and it's cannot, cannot, cannot use segmentation, I mean, acculturation uh, as, uh, as a replacement for a uh, surrogate for a real segmentation. Isolation versus integration. Now, this is a big issue, and I still encounter this on a, da a virtually daily basis on calling on big, co big companies across America. Um, leaving Hispanics in an isolated marketing island is a sure way to frustrate your own efforts. If this isn't part of their whole marketing conversation, if this isn't part of your whole view, world view, you will n lead yourself down a wrong, a, 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 a wrong path. Um, because you, if, if you don't do that, you're, you'll never be able to avoid you know, condescension, language miscues, and message confusion. So all of your marketing needs to consider the big, the big market components as part of the whole. And as, as, as one example that, uh, that Saul mentioned was McDonald's. One of the best companies that does that is, McDo is McDonald's. They consider everybody, everybody, and Coke does that too, must say. Uh, they consider uh, everybody in developing their, their whole, whole campaign. So they, they basically do this in such a way with such depth of commitment to that concept, that what they come out with is a positioning that is so, is, it's really very, at a very high level. It's at a very high level, it's very pure, it's very clean, very poetic, it addresses some basic human truth. And so like always, a good one for, for Coke, and actually Walmart does the same thing. Um, but uh, McDonald's, I'm loving it. Me gusta, me encanta. You know, that's the same thing. It's really, loving something is really a pretty easy way to, to you know, the concept to translate because every c culture has that same idea somewhere. Uh, so it's pretty important to, um, to really think about all of, your, all of the cultures you're going to be addressing when you're developing your messaging, your, your basic um, uh, strategy. And that doesn't mean you exactly, you market them to the exact same way, but when you treat them as part of your new American mainstream, their issues are part of your overall strategy. Now, I was talking with one company about this, and they were saying that, oh, well, we don't, we don't look at the highly acculturated at all. But we want to find the, the core human truth in the Hispanic space uh, so that we can see if we can correlate that to the general market. Well, I was saying, you know, that's really a mistake. 
Because when you look at the, the highly acculturated, the highly acculturated are, often, are still Latino. They are still very much 100% Latino. They have cultural Latino values, Latino priorities, Latino sensibilities and tastes. Uh, they're, many, they're, you know, they're competent in the American culture, but they still have core, co those core values. And if you don't look at them, you will probably not find those core human truths because many, in many ways what you're doing is you're panning for gold, right? You're panning for gold and you, you take everybody in there and you, you, know, you, you, you might find some pebbles, you might find some little nuggets, but when you, when you get down to the highly acculturated, what you're finding in there as Hispanic nuggets, as Hispanic truths, those are really very refined and there, there will really be um, the core essence. And then you're going to be able to be in a position, as General Mills did, as, as, as P&G often does, uh, and uh, Walmart does too, and McDonald's certainly, um, and Coke as well. Um, they, they, they find that basic core human truth, and they appeal to that, they address that. But where, where you'll often find that is in the most highly acculturated Latinos. So um, I had a lot of fun doing work with the, 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 the Got Milk campaign. Um, and we're doing, uh, talking to unacculturated, uh, highly acculturated and bicultural Latinos um, because the Hispanic campaign, I mean, the general market campaign was Got Milk. Everybody knows it. It's really cool. It's really funny. Everybody loved it. It was a monster hit. We show the ads in the groups. So everybody goes, ah, ha, ha, just instantly. Instant, like, falling over themselves laughing. So, um, but then we showed that the, Sp the, the Spanish language campaign was really seemingly quite clunky because they really couldn't use Got Milk because it basically tran translated as, are you lactating? <laughs> so they didn't want to really do that. So um, uh, this wasn't a pro-breastfeeding uh, uh, campaign. So um, they had to do something different. So they came out with, uh, les dio usted suficiente leche hoy. Now, if, that's almost like the anti-got milk. Got milk is so funny, so short, so sweet. But this is, did you give them enough milk today? We, you know, it's just like reminding people to make sure you give kids, your kids you know, lots of milk. And they don't show mom because they're afraid of the lac lactating thing to show grandma. Uh, so, okay, we're showing these com commercials to, um, to, to these people who are highly acculturated who thought got milk was the funniest thing they've ever seen. They laugh and laugh and laugh. And they showed, they showed them the Hispanic campaign. They went, oh, they got it. It reached their heart. It touched them. It moved them. And they understood it. And they loved it. And they loved it as much as they loved Got Milk, but in a very different way, because it touched a different part of their consciousness. So it's just, you know, so you don't always market to the people the same way, but you have to still think about and consider everybody's point of view and everybody's different, you know, all the various pieces of, of the American mosaic. So um, communicate, don't translate. Now, Simply translating in general market efforts from English to Spanish is, a, is vastly underserving your potential and virtually guaranteeing problems. Virtually guaranteeing problems. One of the ways I presented this uh, uh, at, in my internal meeting in, in my company was presenting, uh, trying to pitch to everybody across every field and every industry uh, in America about the importance of doing multicultural work. And I started the whole presentation in Spanish. Got a few laughs from, from that. I said, oh, you actually want to hear this presentation in a language you understand. Okay. So then I presented the whole, that, that exact page that had been in Spanish in really badly translated English. And it brought home the, the issue because uh, I used pieces of, of, of uh, sort of uh, Australianisms and Canadianisms and, uh, and English uh, expressions as well as Americans. And I used archaic language and really clung, clunky grammar, uh, grammatical structures that were, you know, direct literal translation. It's like you put it through Google Fish, that's what you get. Uh, it's just like, it's just really bad. And so they, it, was, it just brought the whole issue home. And they realized this is what they do to their Hispanic consumers when they just translate a questionnaire. You have no idea what you're talking about. So the answers you're going to get from that data is going gonna, gonna to be rather random. People will say, oh, God, I've got to finish this questionnaire, but I have no idea what they're asking about. Oh, I'll put this. And go on. That's what, it's called. That's what we call, we made up a word, satisficing. <laughs> satisficing. We're just satisfying the need, for, you know, the, the demand of the questionnaire and just going on. But basically the only kind of translation that works is one that's done so well that you can't tell it wasn't originally written in Spanish. And the way we do that in our, in our group is that we, when we write a, a Spanish language, uh, an English questionnaire that will be in Spanish and in English, we think of the Spanish. We have the Spanish in our heads 
as we're writing the English. Because you can get into grammatical structures that simply can't be translated. It's just really, you just, it's just, it's, you're going to get yourself down a rabbit hole that you won't be able to get out of. So, um, so we, I, we, we write the, the English with our Spanish in our heads so that we're, we're not writing them both simultaneously, but we know what will work and what will be clear. So we end up writing, actually, and the result is better English. Because it's simpler, it's clearer, it's more direct, fewer dangling participles and fewer, you know, misdirections and mis, you know, complicated sentence structures. So it ends up, you end up doing a better job with your English version than you would have otherwise because you had another language in your head at the same time and it had to really address both. So you don't translate words. You translate meaning, tone, mood, flavor, and cultural context. So you might as well just write it in Spanish. Because often, you know, it's so easy to, to get the tone wrong, to get the mood wrong, to, to influence people, to, to bias your questionnaire. So um, obviously culturally attuned messages are key in marketing, particularly when these messages are, are a part of your overall corporate and or brand strategy. So you know, if this stuff is important to you, and it better be, because that's your job, um, then you really have to be aware of what you're doing. And, and that includes means including the, the Hispanic market in your thinking. So this, this, I say this, young Latinos want to be known for who they are, not what they are. And I think that's really, very, really pretty basic. But honestly, I think that applies to every, every, everyone. And I certainly, certainly to all young people. They don't want to be Zoomed. Don't sell me. Talk to me. Don't sell me stuff. Just speak to me. And because they want to be re re referred to for who they are, what, who they are and, and what they're doing, not, you know, what category you, you, you think you want to lump them into. I remember doing some, 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 uh, some ad test sessions, and we had a group of young people who all spoke Spanish, and we were testing these ads that showed, you know, it was for a, a beverage company, a soft, soft beverage company, and... Um, and um, so we had these kids, and they were sitting in the room. They were, they were very sitting there, very properly, and proper, uh, you know, demurely. And um, so they were answering the questions, and we were going through the the, the, air, the questionnaire and the the, the whole discussion. It was they were all very nice and very demure. And then at one point, there was something that had I had to say in English, and I said it in English with no accent, American English with no accent, so they could tell I spoke English. So they went, oh. And they completely transformed. These prim and proper, perfectly polite, nice, you know, little kids became urban youth. They became American urban youth. They started bobbing their heads and said, I don't think so. You know, uh, and they were just so funny. I mean, they were absolutely hysterical. But their whole body language changed. Their whole mood changed. Uh, so, you know, it's putting people into categories is just the wrong way to do it. Uh, just who are they? What do they like to do? Are, are they soccer players? I mean, you know, it, it's, um, I actually went to see... Um, the World Cup when it was, came to in America, and it was at, at Stanford Stadium, and my sister was uh, doing grad school there, so I actually stayed at her, her graduate apartment there, um, and we went to see the, the, the World Cup, and um, we came out of the game, uh, we walked into town, uh, into you know, this, the little t part of Stanford that had restaurants and clubs and things, and they, uh, anyway, so they were all, the, of course, the World Cup games from all around the country were on, and this was, Palo Alto, California, very, very straight-laced, you know, place. And all of the state, all, every bar and every restaurant had the games on in Spanish because they were so much more fun. And anybody who's into soccer knows that watching soccer in English sucks. It's like, oh, James pestered to Smith and Smith pestered to James and James took a shot and missed. Oh, darn. Well, as you listen to Spanish, it's like, ay, paso, paso aquí, lo paso ya, mira, está corriendo aquí. You know, it's just, it's such a more dramatic experience. I and mean, even when, you know, the, the, the ball goes sailing 50 yards above the goal, you would think that that was the most exciting thing in the world. So, I mean, if, so if you're into soccer, you're into that. So even English-speaking soccer players, soccer, kid, kids who play soccer, will watch Spanish language TV for that. So you have to know that when you're doing your Spanish language advertising and you're, you're buying space, you're buying time or doing, you know, some little surround things or uh, be getting involved in, 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 the, in uh, the, the, the World Cup uh, um, games, you're reaching English-speaking consumers as well. Uh, absolutely. So, um, 
So anyway, so but behind this curtain, I said, the last point there, you see that you know, the big story in the Hispanic space, and that is the, the, the bilingual, bicultural segment, is revealing itself as the dynamic growth sector. It's now at least 50%. It used to be that, that it was like 50% unacculturated, 25% bicultural, 25% uh, highly acculturated. So now it's still 25% highly acculturated, but it's now 50% bicultural, bi bi bilingual. And the, 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 the least acculturated group is only 25%. So that's a big change. But people assume that people would just bounce straight into highly acculturated, and that's not happening. They're getting into the bilingual bicultural, which means any campaign you're going to be doing in English is going to reach them. So if you, sell, you tell them something in, in, in the, your general market campaign and tell them something different in the Spanish language campaign, and they're not coordinated, they're like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. What are they saying? What, you know, so, so if you do that, you're, you're just asking for trouble. Mom knows best. In the Hispanic space, and this works across the, across the acculturation uh, levels, mom knows best. Mom buys stuff, mom orders stuff, even when the whole family goes with her, the, the dad goes with her, he does what mom tells him. You, honey, you get that, you get that. put that back. You know, they're very clear, mom's rule. Mom's rule. This whole thing about you know, machismo and all that ostensible patriarchal structure. Um, <laughs> it's all about moms, moms rule everything, they do everything. And the only thing they won't do is buy beer. I don't think my mom, my, my dad drank a lot of beer in his life. And mother never bought one single drop of that, not one. So, um, so anyway, but one interesting thing is you know, the moms do all that, but they don't think it's all about them. They know it's not all about them. They're buying for their family. They, want to buy, they would want to cook something that no one's going to eat just because they wanted to do it. They want to make their, fans, their happy family happy. They want to get their kids to actually eat. They want to have this whole thing, experience to be positive for them. Whether they like cooking or not cook, uh, don't like cooking, they still want everybody to be happy. So they know that it's not about them. So selfish appeals to them, please, one, one really good example of a, of, of a bad uh, general market campaign, the Hispanic campaign for this pizza that showed the whole family eating and the grandma, and, you know, the, the dog, you know, it's like everybody's there. So uh, they might as well have brought in some dead relatives. Um, but the whole, the whole family was there eating this pizza. The general market version of the ad showed a, a, a working woman come home, kick off her heels, stick a f frozen pizza in the, uh, in the oven, you know, it pops up, bing, and she takes it out, and she sits on the sofa, uh, to, watch, to watch the news, and she's stretched on the sofa, and her husband reaches over the sofa to grab a piece of the pizza, and she slaps his hand. And if you're Hispanic, say, wait a minute, why would you cook if you didn't want to share? Why would you even think about doing that? I mean, how selfish can you be? How horrible is that? I mean, it's like, no. Uh, they're, they're trying to communicate in, in the general market, they're trying to communicate that this is so good you won't want to have to share it. But that's exactly the opposite, exactly the opposite message in the Hispanic space. If it's not worth sharing, it's not good. I wouldn't share something that I knew was bad, but I was desperately hungry, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't oh, oh honey, have some of this. It, it sucks. You know. <laughs> no, but if you, if you think it's good, honey, have some. You'll love it. That's the whole point. Why else would you cook? There's no other reason. I mean, please. So anyway, the point is that you know, even with uh, these, um, these women who are making these choices, the content part, you know, they really try to make their families content. They want their families to be content. So um, that can include in a lot of indulgences, even if they don't really have the money. I don't know how they do it. It's just magic, and you have to capture that magic in your marketing. But they do do it. Consensus and compromise. Remember those words? We used to actually have those words in America. They actually used to be part of our national discourse. Well, they are no longer part of that, for sure. But they still rule Hispanic families because families have to, don't have, lim they have limited budgets and large families, so they have, to, they have to find ways to make this work because they can't buy six different types of sodas and three different, four different brands of cereal. They, you know, they've got to find things that everyone likes and they have to be, love each other enough to be okay with not getting what they want precisely. If everyone else likes it, they'll be okay with that. They'll be happy with that. So they do eat in abundance, uh, they enjoy each other's companies, and they manage to be happy. Um, it doesn't mean they don't face a lot of problems, but they endure, and the one way they, they endure is by finding compromise, buying the brand of crackers, the brand of cereal, the brand of, of uh, whatever it is they, they, they want or need, 
uh, that everyone will like. Hispanics don't live in a one-on-one -on -one world. Now this seems really um, very clear to me. And as a researcher, you know, we get asked to do a lot of one-on-ones. They're always interested, the research marketers are always interested in, you know, consumers' opinions in, in, in isolation. Well, we don't want them to be influenced by each other. We want to know what, you know, that one person that thinks. Well, Hispanics don't ever do that. One example of that was uh, so someone was, was doing, a, one of my clients was doing a door hanging thing. And she was a, she was a marketing person. She was supervising this door hanging effort. And they were laying little bags of cookies on people's doorknobs in this one particular Latino neighborhood to see how that might go. And they were sort of testing this concept. And, and, she, and, she, and the woman who was supervising went, went back to her car and was taking notes or you know, respond, calling her, e her cell phone or something. And she said, saw this one woman come home and she saw the cookies on her doorknob. So she took the cookies and went, oh, cookies. So she runs next door, and she knocks on the door. Her friend says, oh, look, you've got cookies too. And then the, the, the two of them grabbed their cookies, ran across the street to their, their comadre's house, and they, banged, they knocked the door, and, they, and they, they went over to share their cookies with her. And that side hadn't even been, hadn't been uh, worked yet, so they hadn't been, been delivered the cookies, but they went over to share their cookies with her because this was their friend, and they, they, draw, they become the opinions, they, they develop opinions together as groups. So um, I, you can't market to people, uh, Hispanics, in an isolated way. What their neighbors like influences what they'll buy, because the neighbors are going to come over. What their cousins and, 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 and nie aunt likes. If, if you, know, you, you don't like cashews at all, but your aunt likes cashews, you're going to have cashews at home for her, because she's going to come by for once in a while. So, uh, so people do buy things and think about other people. This other consciousness used to really pretty much drive America. It used to be pretty standard. But we got more and more and more isolated, more and more me, 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 me. And, uh, and Hispanics are not there. And that's a really good thing. And so when people talk about you know, not understanding the Hispanic market, what they don't understand is themselves. What they don't understand is what they, what they used to be like. They don't understand what American, real American values were, which is all about sharing, all about caring, all about being attentive to other people, all about making your family happy, making sure that everybody's all together, having dinner together, and talking about their lives and their, what's going on, and, share, and, and providing things that they love and they like, and, um, and not just having it be what you want, or not, just, not having not cooking three different dinners, you know, having, ha having stuff that everyone likes. So how this is all going to play out online is, is really going to be very interesting going forward because, um, you know, in the social media, the blogosphere, mobile devices, all that stuff is still very much uh, evolving. But given how important the social context is to Hispanics, it seems inevitable that it will happen. Uh, I always say you never see a single Latino in the parks in Los Angeles. They're always in th groups of 35 or more because <laughs> they are. They go out and do things in groups. Uh, and this is a really important concept when you consider uh, marketing to the Hispanic market. But the buying process for Hispanics is, is really definitely changing. There's nothing like a big fat recession to really, you know, make people have to uh, figure out how coupons work, how uh, discounts work, how to, how to make, make dollars stretch. Um, and they really do do that. You know, Hispanics were disproportionately hit hard by the, by the, the, uh, the downturn. They were hit disproportionately hard uh, by the uh, subprime crisis because um, they were more likely to be victims of the sub subprime uh, predation. Um, but, you know, the way they handled it, they've got family. They've got cousins, they've got brothers, they've got, you know, second, you know, aunts. They just moved in. You know, it's like, you don't even think about it. It's like, okay, come on. So, you know, they pull, they pull resources, they do, they, they, you know, they share what they have, whatever little, however little they have, they share it. And, um, and they actually survived the, the recession reasonably well, uh, psychologically at least, um, not necessarily financially, but psychologically uh, and physically, because they had resources. They had people to call on, people to, to, to help them out. Um, it was really interesting to see, to talk to people who lost homes and who you know, lost everything they had. They lost their jobs and all that stuff. But they were still OK. They had their family. They had their love. They were good. You know, my father's favorite expression was saying, it's only money. Money isn't your health. J Bill Jobs, for all the money he had, couldn't buy a liver or and a pancreas. You know, so there, there are you know, some things that money just won't buy. And, 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 and when Latinos 
uh, struggle and they don't, there's a lot of things they don't have, they do have love and they do have health and they do, you know, they, they, they have a, a support system and that makes a big difference. But uh, anyway, so Hispanic market is getting complicated. It used to be very simple. You simply called your ad agency, the ad agency called Univision, boom, done. You did Spanish language advertising, that was all they had to do. Well, that, those days are gone. It's much more complicated now. You do have, of course, traditional broadcast ads. They're very important. But you also have to recognize that your English language advertising is impacting on the Hispanic market as well. You also have to recognize that you're, um, you know, you're going to be doing a lot more interactive stuff. You know, the concepts, concerts and events and um, doing a lot of work online. Um, actually, I, I moderated a, a, a session about um, uh, the digital media and the new media and how things are changing in the Hispanic space. And we had a really interesting panel. This is in L.A. And um, it was really a fascinating discussion. But the world is changing and you have to change with it or get left behind on that little eroding spit of land with Katrina coming. Um, so, uh, but Hispanics really do like to share uh, recipes. That's why, you know, the, the Que Rica Vida, the, the General Mills program is working so well. Kraft has one like that. Uh, uh, Avon has one like that. Uh, several companies have, are, are moving in that direction and they're doing more and more online stuff. Hispanics love to share. They love new ideas. Uh, and so uh, they love to communicate. They're all about connectivity. So, um, and Hispanics have adapted smartphones faster than the general market, than the quote unquote, now lieutenant market. Um, and it's really, uh, it's made a big deal, it's been a big deal for them. Uh, it's often the way they access the internet. Uh, they don't have computers at home, but they'll have a smartphone. Uh, and uh, so uh, one of the good ex best examples of how to do this in the Hispanic space, how to do marketing in the Hispanic space is really, just look at what Cricket, Metro PCS, and Boost Mobile have done. Really impressive. They have physical presence in the communities. They have the ability for people to, you know, no commitment for long-term contracts. You can go and pay every month. You can go in person and pay in cash if that's what you want to do. Uh, and they have smartphones uh, available, uh, a lot of mostly Androids. Uh, but uh, uh, they're, they're doing really well, and the adoption is, uh, is zooming. And uh, if you really want to study, study the Hispanic market and success stories and how to do it right, check out those three companies. Um, and um, going on to re Hispanic research, which is I, what I do for a living, um, that's my main focus, although my new focus is going to be multicultural uh, moving forward. But uh, really, research is not a commodity. It isn't just about translating a questionnaire. It isn't about the numbers. I always felt that I became a better quantitative researcher when I became a qualitative researcher, because you realize the numbers aren't about the numbers. The numbers are about people. And you're talking for stories, you're looking for through lines, lives, uh, perceptions, experiences, um, and it's all, about, it's all about people. So to do that properly, it really takes, the, the, the big word is respect. That you don't care about how much money these people earn, you don't care how much education they have, you don't care how, how you know, what their weight is, their height is, or anything else. All you know is that they're human beings, you respect them, and it hopefully love them, and you know, if you do have those things in your back pocket, the work that you do will reflect that, and uh, you'll be good. Um, having done it before doesn't hurt. You know, a lot of experience helps because you know there are always things along the way that 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 you need to learn. But I've uh, said to many companies who have still not really entirely gone down the path of starting in the Hispanic market, um, the key thing is, you know, you you, you you can't use the fact that other people have a, a head start on you as an excuse to not do something. On the contrary, you can see that as an advantage because they've, they've already gone down these paths and there are a lot of case stories about there, out there about bad things that people have done, you know, stupid things that people have done. And you don't, you know, you just, you now have learned a lot from all these other people's failures uh, and stumbles so that you can go down, you know, a, a very efficient path. So, uh, so t taking on the challenge of seeing Hispanics clearly is daunting. It, it is daunting, but because uh, there's so many factors to consider, but a, a little goodwill goes a long way, a long, long way. And um, honestly, everybody I know who works in Hispanic marketing loves it, just loves it to death, and when they and, and really wants to do that and stay with it. And people who have moved away from one reason or another are desperate to come back. So now that we're starting our big new multicultural practice within GFK, uh, and so many people have come up to me and said, I want to be on that team, and I want to do this. And I've ruffled a lot of feathers because these are often the very best people in other teams. 
um, but they really want to do this bank work because it's so satisfying. You really get to give your community a voice. These are people whose voices and opinions and thoughts and feelings are not typically heard, and they deserve to be heard, they need to be heard, and um, people always talk about client service as being the number one thing, you gotta really serve your clients. But honestly, I think the best thing you can do for your clients is to serve the, the community, to serve the Latino community, to, be, to provide their unfettered, unfu unfussed with, accurate voice, and properly interpreted and properly understood and properly you know, re done uh, voice to people who need to hear it. They can't guarantee that they're gonna do anything about it, they can't guarantee that they're gonna really provide them the products and services they really need and deserve, but at the very least they will have heard their voice. So my goal is to be that and do that for my community, and in, the, in, in so doing, I'll make my clients very happy and make them look very smart, because hopefully with better information, they'll make better decisions. And when clients see, see the numbers and, and come to some wrong conclusions, I push back. I'm not afraid to say, no, I think you're really wrong about this. This is not what you're gonna, this is not right because, and I give reasons, I give historical experience, I give uh, side examples from other, 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 other companies, other, um, without naming the, the company, but naming other, or other categories. Say, people have done that before, it doesn't work, that's not the right thing to do, this is what's gonna happen, this is the wrong thing to do. So you have to stand up for what you know, you stand up for what you believe, and let people know that and share that with them. Uh, and even if you sometimes ruffle a few feathers, and some, you encounter some marketing people who think it's all about them, and it's all about their career, and not about the consumer, and um, they're out there, and you know, if they choose to fire me, that's fine. I don't need to work for them again anyway, because they, you know, they're, they're in it for the wrong reason, and they won't be there very long anyway. So, I wanted to ask if they, how much time I, we have left for Rick. Okay. So uh, obviously I've, I've, I've said a lot of things here that are, that are sort of my personal perceptions. Uh, I don't uh, assume that that's the only way of seeing things. Uh, I was curious if anybody had any questions um, or things that they wanted to, uh, to share or points of view they wanted to share. Introduce yourself. My name is Ro Roberto Guzman. I work for Finger Hut in the Hispanic Initiative. Uh, my question is, so you spoke a, a lot about the uh, new uh, segmentation uh, bicultural, and then also the people that only speak Spanish and, and highly acculturated. Um, so what's, uh, what's the future for Spanish marketing only? Is there, a, is there still a need to continue doing mar marketing in Spanish? There is a need to communicate in Spanish. Uh, there is a, a segment of the population, and it's a large one given, given the size of the community, that needs information in Spanish. Um, but I believe going forward, I think more and more work is going to be bilingual. Um, more and more work is going to be um, in English and in Spanish, especially for, for, for a company like Finger Hut that does a lot of direct mail. Sometimes they'll look at something that looks nice, they hear it and see it in Spanish, they want to show it to their kids. And if the kids you know, see it only in Spanish, they might think, oh, this, they're, just, they're just zooming you. They're, they're, they're not that serious. They're only marketing the, the Spanish dominant. They're, 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 they're trying to use you. So when you, when you do things in, in, that are bilingual, um, it sort of expands their the universe. It shows that you're selling to everyone and anyone, and you're not just isolating them or putting them out on, on a little limb all by themselves, that you're, you're marketing to them as human beings, not as Latina, Latinos. So um, I think more and more work is going to be bilingual, and less and less will be Spanish dominant, Spanish only. Because the English language work is going to reach English, you know, the Spanish speakers as well, and there'll be other people in their home, their home. You know, even within any one family, there's no one absolute rule about how, what level of acculturation every single individual will be, and what their language competence will be. Often, what happens is the, you know, the, if, if the family work, family members who work outside of the home uh, will be exposed to more in English and need more develop more English skills than people who are not. Um, and in, some people have more language skills than others, and it, they, they may have depend, come to the United States at a different age. So uh, all of those things impact on, on their language ability, but um, to think that the old way of doing things was do Spanish only and completely separated, isolated Spanish efforts, English efforts, and I think that's really go slowly going away, uh, and I think more and more work is gonna be bilingual. Next question for this. So, but you're talking about having bilingual for the total market or bilingual for the Hispanic market? Um, 
just as, 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 as this is kind of the same issue that the gay community faced with, you know, or J.C. Penney faced with putting Ellen DeGeneres as their spokeswoman for, for J.C. Penney. Um, are they marketing to, to, to gay people only? No. They're using her because she's a star and because she's funny and she's cool. And that's why they're using Ellen DeGeneres. They're not marketing only to gay people. And she's, she's good because she's good. And she's, not, she's funny not because she's gay. She's funny because she's funny. And she's cool and she's hip and she's, she's charming and, and, and has a wonderful presence. She has a very popular show. And, 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 you know, she's a star. And that's why they're using her. So in the Hispanic space, the same basic concept should apply that um, many, as I said, many general market consumers admire or like things Latino. So uh, when Ms. Vergara from, from Modern Family is, is pitching a product, are they marketing to only Latinos? No. They're marketing to, to women who want to be hot. <laughs> and who find her hot. And men go, men just drool. And, and women just faint because she's so beautiful. And they, want, they aspire to be like her. So why not? What the, but the point is that when you're marketing, you're marketing to people. You're marketing to human beings. You're marketing to America. And America isn't what it used to be. America is different. And a big segment of America is now bilingual. So you put, uh, put materials out there in Spanish, or that mostly in English and with Spanish available, or put one side in English, one side in the Spanish, or one side of the page in English, one side of the page in Spanish, or different columns, whatever, however you do it. I don't think there's any one format that's absolutely perfect, um, but it'll depend on your category, depend on your brand, depend on the purposes of your campaign. But, um, but no, I, th I think uh, in America, there will be more language options than were available in the past, and bilingual materials will, are likely to be more visible going forward. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm working with, uh, with our friends from the National Guard, and they're, they're here today, and um, have some great opportunities for, for Latinos. But uh, they sent me an email um, trying to do some marketing, and it was the old Uncle Sam we want you, and and they sent the trans translation is de deseo. No, no. I said, well, I, well, I said you can't do that because you'd have this this old man with a beard saying, "We want you." So there is a there's, there's another example we haven't well we haven't heard we haven't heard back on that one. But I don't know if you. Have you would say, well, this is something you could use instead. I don't know if you changed that brand. Well, you know, that you could probably, uh, Saul could probably help you with that. And it really isn't, it isn't, what, what the, con the multicultural consciousness isn't, you know, once you know how to do it and you can think about it, Saul can do that for you yeah. too. Yeah. And, and you could do it, he could do it for, for you know, for, for, for Spanish as well. But de deseo means I want you. I mean, I want you physically. Yeah. And, and, uh, and <laughs> I lust for you, honey. Um, so, um, you probably don't want to say that, um, and, uh, I mean, it's like, don't ask, do tell, um, but, um, um, no, so, tra so translation is tricky, and you might have to go to a whole different, uh, uh, why people would join the National Guard might be a, a totally different pr thought process, a totally different way of identifying, becoming part of America, identifying with, with something so strong and powerful as, as the American military. Um, and the National Guard, uh, which has many very positive traits, um, but uh, and very appealing to Latinos. Latinos are, you know, uh, I would think a, a prime target for you guys. We've done re work recently for uh, the U.S. Navy, and uh, um, it's it's a prime target. And so, uh, getting the right message and the right language is important, and you have to research it and get out there with messages and ideas, and don't just assume that you do a direct little translation. You're good, David. Oh, I'm sorry, not David. Uh, the focus of your presentation. Uh, say again. Oh, my name is Rick Swanson, and um, uh, viewing the presentation uh, in terms of marketing to Hispanics as consumers, how would I uh, translate uh, the message there when I think of? Uh, marketing to uh, Hispanic entrepreneurs, business owners, employers, uh, things like that. Would, uh, would the tactics or thinking change for someone like me who'd be focusing on that more than on the consumer? 
That's a really good point, uh, question. Uh, we do some B2B work ourselves, and I was, of course, a, a, an entrepreneur for 21 years, and I ran my own company for a long, long time, so I was often the target for much of that advertising and the, that communications. So um, I do have a lot of thoughts about that, but one of the key things when you think about Hispanic consumers, Hispanic entrepreneurs, their scale is probably very different from what the Asian consumer might be, and the Asian B2B market might be. Um, uh, Saul was talking about the, 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 the size. There are twice as many uh, Hispanic uh, entrepreneurs as Asian, but the Asians' uh, revenue was much higher. So um, it's, uh, the Hispanic small businesses are probably going to be smaller in scale with smaller ambitions. Uh, they're going to be beauty salons and plumbing shops and, you know, um, they're just, they're, they're l l uh, printing shops. They're less likely to be to want to start a franchise with 135 printing shops. They're more likely to want to have a nice little job with a nice little career, you know, a little shop. So, uh, so you have to definitely consider what scale people expect to go to. So if you show, you know, American Express will show, you know, the woman who founded Mrs. Fields and she was baking cookies and now she's got a, a store in every mall in America. Well, that's way beyond the Hispanic scope. That's way beyond their dreams. They, don't, they wouldn't even want to go that far. They really wouldn't. But they'd love to have a nice little business. They'd love to be able to lead this business to their children. Um, they'd love to, uh, you know, have a presence and dignity in, uh, in, their, in their community. So there are different traits and different values that these people would have that you would need to respect and understand and, and appreciate and, uh, and market to them accordingly. So one of the things that we just did a big study for a major um, financial services company, and they wanted us to apply a, this ridiculous questionnaire that was just made all these assumptions about what people even want for, out of their lives, their, their relationship to money. What are their goals? What, is it, what level of financial literacy do they have? They were just making all these assumptions that Hispanics were exactly the same as, as their general market counterparts, and even with the same incomes, they're not. Their goals, their aspirations, their dreams, their, their perspectives, their values are different. So I said, look, no, 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 I won't do that. We have to go back and understand from the get-go, from the basics, how they see money, what, they, what their, their finan personal, financial, personal and family financial goals are, and you know, what their ambitions are, and what, what they know and what they don't know. And um, so we, di we did that, and the client was, was really very, very, ultimately very happy. But it started out by saying, no, I won't do that. Any other questions? Yes. Carlos Garcia, ladies and gentlemen, thanks Carlos.